All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to talk this morning about climate change you can believe in. <laughs> and of course, uh, I'm not going to call Al Gore a fool or an idiot because he's not. Um, when it comes to science, he is. But when it comes to being a con artist, he's not a fool. Very intelligent man. <laughs> and, you know, when, you, when you're good enough that you can con people out of... I heard recently that he's made over a billion dollars as a result of this whole climate change thing. See, he has companies that will profit from people having to pay taxes and, and whatever you know, to them. So he's not a fool. He's a con artist. You know, but uh, do I believe in climate change? Yeah. But I'll say this. It's not because of SUVs. It's because of SIN, <laughs> you know. And there will be some climate change, serious climate change in the future. We're going to look at that from the Bible this morning. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Okay. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth." Uh, let me keep reading here. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Okay, now uh, a couple questions here. Uh, first of all, who are the twenty-four elders? A lot of people say, well, the 12 apostles and then the 12, uh, 12 men from the Old Testament. No, can't be. Because verse 9, "...hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation." So, all the, the 12 apostles and the men from the Old Testament, they were Jews. You know, so these aren't all Jews. They're probably some of them are. So who are they? Well, I'll be honest with you. I have no idea. I really don't. You know, I mean, there are the seven churches mentioned in the first three chapters of Revelation, but that's seven. That's not 12. So who are they? I have no idea. I really don't know. But the point is, there's a group of people there, and I believe that these angels that are mentioned, that they are Christians. Okay, uh, Jesus said about in the resurrection will be as the angels of God. And what are we called right now? We are called the sons of God. Now, back in the Old Testament, the sons of God were angels. Okay? And a lot of them fell. So, I think that we're kind of the replacement for, for that, for those sons of God. And that's a whole other study. I don't want to get into it. But the point is, verse 10 there, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, I'll read two verses here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Okay, And it goes on to say that he can't deny himself. So it's not talking about salvation there. It's talking about your reign. Okay, Don't deny Jesus Christ if you're a Christian. Don't be ashamed of him because if you are, you're not going to get any millennial inheritance apparently. Maybe you'll just be a janitor or something like that for the thousand years. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So there is a thing there about Christians ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Now, turn back a couple chapters here to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which, which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead 
and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Contrary to what John MacArthur teaches, it is the blood that saves you. Okay, Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, you see there again, those that are washed in the blood, Christians, the seven churches there, it's clearly the church age Okay, that we are currently in. Back there in the first century, I realize, but, you know, they were Christians, and they will be Christians. The body of Christ exists until the rapture. So you have the people there washed in the blood. They're Christians. And it says, and hath made us kings and priests. Okay? So you see that thing again of we're going to reign on the earth with Jesus Christ for the millennial kingdom. So now turn over to Revelation chapter 6. So you see Revelation 5, 8 and 12, 8 through 12, you see that this group is in heaven there. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Um, Revelation 5, the, the book is presented and no man is found worthy to open it. But Jesus Christ is the lamb. He's the one that takes the book to open the seals. But Revelation chapter 6, 1 and 2 says, And a and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now that's the Antichrist. And don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that that is Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who's opening the seal. <laughs> So why would he open the seal and then somehow jump into the book and come out, you know, on the earth? And you read down through there, these seals that are opened. And, you know, it's war, famine, death, hell, you know. I mean, is that what Jesus Christ brings with him? No, he brings the saints with him. Now jump down to verse 15 of Revelation chapter 6. Uh, and it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now when does that happen? That's at the end of the tribulation. You can read... The parallel to that is Revelation 19. Okay, so it's not the same thing here. Revelation, or yeah, chapter 6, 1 and 2 is the Antichrist showing up. 15 through 17 is Jesus Christ. But the point is, Christians are in heaven before the Antichrist shows up here on the earth. Okay, we're there when the seal is open and the Antichrist is loosed on the earth. So to teach that we're going to go through the tribulation is really quite ridiculous. And I'm going to do a study on that. Um, I actually found out that it has been a teaching of the Roman Catholic Church for centuries. That Christ, that the, the church, you know, the church is going to go through the tribulation. And they teach that the rapture is heresy. And they actually, it's funny cause, because they, this one article I printed off of AmericanCatholic.org, they, they wrote about it and the guy said, the, the rapture, the theory of the rapture has only been taught for 200 years now, you know, by John Nelson Darby. It's all oh, it's. And, and then a couple paragraphs later, he says it was condemned in 431 AD as a heresy. <laughs> uh, What's that about double minded men? <laughs> yeah, I'd think. You know, if it's only been taught for 200 years, why was it condemned in 431? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so anyhow, the rapture will be before the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. There's a lot of different names for this seven-year time period coming up. So Christians in heaven, the Antichrist is loosed. Revelation chapter 6 is actually, you're going to see these three different types of judgments. You're going to see the seals, the trumpets, and the vials. Now, I always believed growing up that it will be the seals first, and at the last seal, then the trumpets begin. And then at the last trumpet, the vials begin. No, it isn't that way. They're actually overlapping. And we're going to see that in this study. 
and uh, we're going to see if the Earth, if there's going to be any climate change on the Earth, and there will be. <laughs> uh, some pretty drastic climate change, actually. Okay, but uh, this thing about um, Jesus Christ coming back with his army, there's a lot of verses, actually, that talk about that. Turn back to the book of Joel. Joel in the Old Testament. It's in the collection of books, the Minor Prophets there. There's a lot of stuff in these books that's very interesting. Most people don't really read it that much, though. But uh, Joel chapter 2 is basically about the army that we will be part of when we come back down to the earth. Uh, verses 1 down through 10. It's not about the Antichrist army. It's about the army, the Christian army, that comes back with Jesus Christ. We're going to be going and getting people and bringing them to the judgment of the nations. And that's what I believe Joel chapter 2 is about. But let's start at verse 10. I'm going to read 10 and 11 here. Uh, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Remember the kings? And everybody, they're, they're hiding in the rocks and, and because they're afraid. Who can abide it? You know, the, the rich men of the earth, the, the Navy SEALs, the, um, you know, Spitznots in uh, Russia, you know, the special forces. Nobody is going to be able to stand. Nobody can abide it. Okay? And it's interesting because Jesus Christ comes back not as this lovey peace guy. He comes back as a warrior as the greatest warrior that this nation or that this world's ever seen. Okay, but you'll see this thing about the earth quaking, the heavens trembling, the sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. You'll see this over and over and over again in the New Testament and here in the Old Testament as well. Uh, look over at uh, here in chapter 2, verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Okay, now again, it's Old Testament. All right, so you have this thing of, you know, this event here of the the moon uh, turning into blood, the sun darkened, stars falling from heaven. Okay, now that's not the rapture. Okay, that's not at the beginning of the tribulation. That's clearly at the end before Jesus Christ is revealed. Turn over to Joel chapter 3, verse 15. And we'll see it here again. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Is Jerusalem holy today? No. Will Jerusalem be holy in the Great Tribulation? No. <laughs> Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt in Revelation chapter 11. Okay? It's not holy right now. So, how could you be a amillennial, you know, how could you interpret the Bible through an amillennial type of interpretation? Amillennial is that there is no millennial kingdom the scriptures were all fulfilled back in the past in the first century and, and now we're just kind of existing in this somehow the millennial kingdom turned into 2,000 years you know, instead of 1,000 years. It's ridiculous. Okay? These scriptures haven't been fulfilled yet, but they will be. Okay? Um, it's interesting too. Matthew 5 verse 35 calls Jerusalem the city of the great king. It isn't there right now. Okay, you can turn back to Revelation chapter 7. Um, while you're turning there, there are a couple other places where you'll see this thing of, you know, the moon turning into blood and the sun darkening and stars falling from heaven and all of that. Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. Mark 13, verses 24 through 27. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 27. 
and Acts chapter 2, verse 19 through 21, where Peter actually is quoting uh, Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 30 through 32. So you have that there. Um, but now, uh, as far as Revelation 6 is concerned, it's basically a general overview of the tribulation. It's the beginning, the Antichrist showing up, to the end, Jesus Christ showing up. You have that in that one chapter. You have a overview of the whole thing. Okay, um, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 3 says here, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay? And then it goes on to describe the 144,000 sealed Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, Jews... 12,000 from, from each of the 12 tribes. Okay. But now, is God going to hurt the earth? Yes. Is there going to be climate change? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, is it man-made climate change? Well, no. It's not the fault of man as far as man's factories and SUVs and stuff. No, it isn't that. But it's man's sin. And it's interesting because so many people... All these people, you know, that, that are fighting the New World Order and everything, they're coming out with all this stuff. Well, we need to fight for the Constitution and call your congressman, your senator. What about sin? They never mention sin. I find that very interesting. And you have preachers, quote-unquote, uh, Chuck Baldwin is one down in Florida, and he ran for president the last time. Of course, he obviously didn't win, wasn't even mentioned. But he wrote a couple articles that I read about, you know, restoring the republic and there was not one mention of sin in the whole thing you know and what these people are basically doing is they're, is they're saying we want to bring in a prosperous wonderful kingdom a restored republic <clears throat> in america but we don't want to be told about sin we don't want to give up our sinful lifestyle we don't want to give up our heavy metal music we don't want to give up our alcohol we don't want to give up our profanity but we want God to bless us. And they'll throw the term God bless America around. They'll throw that around just, you know, like anything. You know, like have a good day or something. I mean, it means about the same thing to them. So there will be no, there will be climate change coming. I'll say that. Okay, now we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 8. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. It's kind of interesting because, you know, a point that can be made is, did you ever make your father so mad that he just, you know, kind of stood there speechless? <laughs> Didn't say anything? <laughs> you know? I mean, here God the Father is just kind of like standing there going, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Just quiet, just kind of looking out the earth, and, and you know, it's probably going to be a pretty tense moment there. But uh, we're not going to read all the verses here just for sake of time. You can go back and study this, but the seven trumpets, we're going to look at that. Uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7 You have hail and fire mingled with blood, and one third of all trees burned up, and all green grass is destroyed. Okay? Second trumpet is Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 through 9. You have a, a great burning mountain cast into the sea. One third of the sea turns into blood. One third of creatures in the sea die. And one third of ships are destroyed. Third trumpet is Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. And it's a star called Wormwood. Falls on one third of the rivers and fountains of waters, which I believe are probably springs, people's wells. Okay? Um... And many die because of these waters, because they were made bitter, which I think is, you know, another way of saying that they're poisonous. Okay, now what is it? I don't know. I don't know about all this stuff. You know, you can you can debate it. You can say, well, the 
worm wormwood is a, another name for a nuclear warhead or something you know i've heard that and it it hits the water and then the waters have radioactive stuff in it and that's what kills people well i don't know it could actually be some kind of a star like a meteorite or something i don't know um the fourth trumpet revelation chapter 8 verses 12 through 13 uh, says the third of the sun, moon, and stars is smitten. Night and day is all messed up. And and a angel flies through heaven and warns people about the last three angels with their trumpets. And it's an angel, by the way. It's not the NIV eagle. Right. Okay. Um, the fifth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. The bottomless pit is opened and the locusts come out and sting men with their tails. And the pain of that sting lasts for five months, which is pretty incredible. And just real quick here, uh, turn to Revelation 9, Revelation 9, verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. Now watch this. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. <laughs> so they had a face of a man and a hair of women. <laughs> That's something to think about. Okay, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? 1 Corinthians 11. So, uh, but, you know, it, something interesting here. You read about stuff like this, and I just read a comment uh, recently here. Some guy said, it's really not hard to understand Revelation. It's just hard to believe it. <laughs> you know, I mean, compare this to anything that we know of. A locust coming out with a face as a man and hair like a woman, and he's got a gold crown on his head. A flying locust. I don't know what that is. And they say, well, it's a helicopter. Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, No, it's not a helicopter. You get, you know, what's the sting that lasts five months from a helicopter? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's ridiculous. I do believe it's some kind of a weird, cre I mean, it, co it comes out of the bottomless pit. Who knows what's down there, you know? So I believe it as it's as it's written there. Okay, um, the sixth trumpet is Revelation nine fourteen through twenty one. Four angels are released, what you see in verse fifteen, and and uh, I just want to read here, uh, verse fifteen, chapter nine, verse fifteen, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year. For to slay the third part of men. Now that's pretty exact. Yeah. You say, well, you know, oh man, I think something's messed up. You know, the, the rapture hasn't happened. The tribulation hasn't happened yet. Here we are, 2009. It should have happened in the year 2000. And oh man, maybe maybe the Bible's not true. Or, you know, no. God has everything planned. I don't know exactly why things haven't kicked in yet. You know, but we're getting closer and closer and closer. God is, has it all planned. It's all on schedule. And these guys come out at a specific year, month, day, and hour. The very hour is known when these guys come out. Uh, of course, we, don't, we aren't going to be able to find that out from the Bible. God doesn't tell us that time. But uh, he knows what time it is. Okay, now before the seventh angel sounds his trumpet... Another angel comes down and announces that time should be no longer. You have that in Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. And then the seventh trumpet shows up in Revelation 10, verses 7 through 11. And uh, we'll read here verse 7, Revelation 10, verse 7, because I think this is one of the most amazing verses in the whole book of Revelation. And it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound... The mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Okay, now who are his servants the prophets? We'll go back into the Old Testament. And you'll read the thing about the king coming and, and Joel chapter, well the whole book of Joel really speaks about this return of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation. So here the seventh trumpet is at the end of the tribulation. Okay? But it's the mystery of God should be finished. There won't be any atheists in the tribulation. Atheists are going to be no more. Okay? 
Uh, we're going to get back to that in just a little bit here. Now, Revelation chapter 11, uh, you have two witnesses showing up. Okay, now, who are these two witnesses? Um, let's just read here very quickly. Uh, verse 3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, now, who are they? Well, I believe that they are Moses and Elijah. And you can read about the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was here on the earth. Matthew chapter 17, verse 3 is where you read about that. And Moses and Elijah show up there. Okay, it's very clear that it's them. And, of course, Moses represents the law in the Old Testament, Elijah the prophets. So and now they prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty years ascent or years, yeah. Days. Okay. Which comes out to a little bit less than three and a half years. It's not quite three and a half years. They come down and they're basically going around making all kinds of trouble. And again, I want to get into the millennial, you know, reign here of Jesus, so I'm gonna be skipping a lot of stuff here. You can read this on your own. Um but we'll look at uh, verse 5, I guess, here. It says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. <laughs> That's going to be interesting. You know, I can see it now. They're there, you know, prophesying and out in the street, making all kinds of trouble. And here come the, you know, the Department of Homeland Security troops or, you know, UN troops or whatever. And, you know... The Ministry of Defense has declared this an unlawful assembly. <laughs> Stay where you are, you know. And you are under arrest, you know, and stuff like that. And they turn to them. I don't know if they'll say anything or if they just open their mouth and the fire comes out. But, you know, torch them. <laughs> That's going to be pretty neat. I, and again, how are they going to explain this stuff? You know, the news media is going to have a time of it, you know. And, and can I believe it? Yeah, I believe it's going to happen. I can't give you any examples of of fire breathing prophets, you know. <laughs> you know, figuratively speaking, yes, but you know, literally, guys prophesying and fire coming out of their mouth. Well, you say you believe that? Yeah, I do. I really do. That's not very scientific. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I can't test it. I can't observe it. I can't demonstrate it. So I accept it by faith, and that's enough for me. I don't, you know. I believe it. Whatever. <laughs> if you don't want to think I'm smart or something, well, okay. <laughs> it's happened before. Um, verse 13. They basically get killed there and, and their dead bodies are laying in the streets of Jerusalem, Sodom and Egypt, you know, where our Lord was crucified. Uh, but verse 13, they get called up to heaven in verse 12. Verse 13 says, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. You know, partly when you have a major disaster, God does get some glory from that. Even the secular news media, they'll say it was an act of God. Now, that's not really the kind of glory that he should be getting, but the point is, it's something. You know, they are admitting that, yes, this was God. And you have people that are going through that that are probably screaming, oh my, G-O-D. You know, I'm not going to say it because whatever, but the point is God's going to get some glory from what? Climate change. A major, massive earthquake. And thousands of people are going to die. And that will go to God's glory. You say, oh, what a terrible thing. What, a, what an unloving thing. These people are left behind because they didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. So that's what you got to remember. When you read the book of Revelation and you see all these horrible, cruel things happening, these are happening to Christ-rejecting sinners, not Christians. It's totally illogical to say that a Christian is going to get, you know, we are the bride of Christ, and so for seven years the bride of Christ is going to get beat up by God, you know, so that this bruised and bloodied bride comes up to the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of the tribulation and goes right back down. It's ridiculous. Okay, and that's what the Roman Catholic Church has taught, by the way, for thousands of years. You know, a real Bible-believing Christian wouldn't believe that kind of silly nonsense. 
All right, um, Revelation chapter 12, uh, there you basically have this woman showing up, and I believe it's Israel. Uh, again, we're not going to go through that whole thing, but Satan persecutes this woman. Revelation 13, you have a description of the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. Of course, the beast and the Antichrist are the same um, there. but And you have a description of the mark of the beast, Okay, which is 603 score and 6. Uh, 666. People know about that. Even the lost, unsaved, have an understanding of that. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go off on this, but I do believe that it is a visible mark upon the forehead because it says that uh, later on there in the book of Revelation. But I do believe it is an implantable microchip as well. That's why it's in the hand, in the forehead. And, you know, if they can get microchips into the population... Not only will they be able to control buying and selling, but they'll be able to track you wherever you go. You know, it'd be a really amazing system there. And I don't mean that in a positive way either, by the way. Revelation chapter 14, you have what happens to those who take the mark of the beast. Okay? And then at the end of chapter 14, you have this thing of uh, the Son of Man, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 14. He's sitting on a cloud and he has a sharp sickle and he gathers the grapes of the earth into the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So I believe that this time period here is probably about the halfway mark through the tribulation where God, it's been bad up to that point. You know, you have the third of this dying and the third of that being destroyed, which is very interesting too. The seven trumpets, it's all third a third of this, a third of that, a third of this, a third of that. What's the significance there? I don't know. There again, it's, there's a lot in Revelation that it's a very deep uh, book. Okay, so I don't know what the third thing is all about. That'd be an interesting study. But I think that it's really going to get bad about halfway through the tribulation. And, excuse me, and you're actually going to have God's wrath being poured out at that point. And that's where the vials show up. Okay, in Revelation chapter 15, um, we'll just read it because it's a, it's a pretty short chapter here. It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. A um, couple things interesting there. I do believe, I don't, I don't know, maybe, are, maybe these are the souls of the people that were slain, maybe these are the actual people, maybe there was a... Um, sort of a rapture of tribulation saints there. I don't know for sure. That's going to be another study at another time. But the point is there, they're singing the song of Moses, the law, and the song of the Lamb. Grace through faith, or salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So there is this thing of, the, of faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments. You read that in Revelation 14, verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, you have the thing of the law and uh, faith, basically, there. Uh, verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. There's going to be no doubt. I mean, they're going to try. I think for the first three and a half years, it's going to be some bad stuff going on and I think that the news media is really going to try to cover it up you know well we're we think it was a shift in the weather patterns that's why a third of the water is blood now and you know, <laughs> no it, it you know it's the news media is already having trouble keeping this whole thing of climate change you know the average person doesn't believe in it you know you have people that that are just you know brainwashed that do believe in it but the news media is really having a hard time keeping control of the people. And it's going to be even worse in the tribulation. They're not going to be able to explain this stuff away. 
And people are eventually going to realize that these judgments, these things that are happening, are the judgments of God. They will be made manifest. And there will still be King James Bibles on the earth after the rapture. And so you're going to have people, you know, reading from this book and saying, wait a second, this is exactly what it said was going to happen. You know, so God's judgments will be made manifest. Uh, Revelation 15, verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth for ever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So I think you have this thing of the seven seals going on, then the seven trumpets are still happening, but about halfway through I think that these seven vials, when God says, okay, that's enough, you know, and that's what happens next here. Let's see, where am I at? My notes. Now the first vial, again, we're just going to, kind of go over these quickly. You can read this um, later. It's all Revelation chapter 16. Uh, Revelation 16 verse 2. Uh, you have the first vial being poured out and it's a noisome and grievous sore is given to all who have the mark of the beast. Uh, Re the second vial, Revelation 16 verse 3. The sea is turned into blood, the blood of a dead man, it says there. And uh, every living soul in, died in the sea. It's going to be kind of rough for these dolphin people. <laughs> you know, they half worship the, the dolphins and stuff. And I don't hate dolphins. You know, they're they're a nice fish or whatever. But I mean, these people get fanatical about it. You know, and and they're going to have a rough time there. But uh, the third vial, Revelation chapter sixteen, verse four through seven. The rivers and fountains of water are also turned into blood. So, you know, it's not only going to be the sea, it's going to also be the rivers and the fountains of waters. So you're going to have all water being turned into blood, which is pretty incredible when you think about that. Um, but verse 7, look at verse 7 very quickly there. It says, And I heard another... Uh, out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Don't question why God is doing this. It's true and it's righteous. Okay, he knows what he's doing. Um, the fourth vial, Revelation 16, 8 through 9. We're going to read this one because here's, here's global warming. Here it comes. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. <laughs> And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. There you have your climate change people, <laughs> you know. So uh, there is global warming coming. Okay, Revelation 16, verse 10 through 11, you have the fifth vial being poured out, and God sends darkness, pain, and sores to the Antichrist and his staff. <laughs> You know, his cabinet, his people there. Um, the sixth vial, uh, Revelation 16, verses 12 through 16, the river Euphrates is dried up to prepare for the battle of Armageddon. And then the seventh vial is uh, Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. There's a great earthquake. And at that point, God remembers Babylon and gives her the cup of the fierceness of his wrath. Okay, now turn over to Revelation 17. Who is Babylon? Well, without going into a huge study on it, um, verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6 tells you who it was. 
And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now there is only one church, one place that is called the mother church. Basically the mother, it's compared to a woman. And that is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, this can only be the Roman Catholic Church. And there are a bunch of nuts out there saying, well, this is America. America is Mystery Babylon. Nonsense. <clears throat> America is not guilty of shedding the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. Give me a break. It's ridiculous. And look at the collars there. And the woman was arrayed in red, white, and blue collar. No. Purple and scarlet. You know, it's clear, very clearly Rome. I mean, look at any kind of a big meeting of, of all the cardinals and archcardinals and archbishops and all the, you know, all the pedophiles. Yeah. Look, look at their meeting, and it's all purple and scarlet. That's how they dress. I think it's bishops that are in purple, cardinals in scarlet. I, I do think that that's how it is. Um, it's kind of interesting here. This big thing in the news that the Pope got tackled on Christmas Eve by a woman. Yeah. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, she took him down to the ground. And I don't know what her story was. You know, she might have been a child that was, you know, as a child she might have been molested, I'm trying to say. I don't know. I don't know what her story was, but it's kind of good, you know. <laughs> I kind of enjoyed that. You know, she, you know, here he is walking in with a big procession and he's got this big stupid gold crown on, you know, the crown of Dagon, basically, if you study it. Yeah, and she she just up over the railing, you know, and tuck him down to the ground. That's great. Uh, hope she's all right. She's probably I'd hate to be her right now. But um, anyhow, we'll continue on here. But Revelation chapter seventeen describes the Roman Catholic Church, and you know people say, well, when this was written, the Roman Catholic Church didn't exist. Okay, well, you could make that true then with the whole Bible. You know, well, that Revelation was you know written by John back then, and and uh, implantable microchips didn't exist, so Revelation 13 can't refer to them. Well, that's stupid, you know. And by the way, they say, well, Babylon there, that's in Iraq, okay? Yeah, but it's mystery Babylon, and Babylon, Iraq, is not guilty of the blood and of the saints and martyrs of Jesus either. There's only one place that can be guilty of that, and that is Rome. Okay, it's very clearly Rome. Uh, Revelation chapter 18, um, look at verse 17. <clears throat> Revelation eighteen seventeen. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as stood by, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city? is like unto that this great city, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. The Roman Catholic Church is going to be, Rome is going to be destroyed in one hour by Almighty God. And it's kind of interesting too because remember one of the judgments was to destroy a third of the ships in the sea? Could that be part of it? I don't know. But the point is, Rome will be destroyed. And, and you know, the people say, well, okay, yeah, the Catholic Church killed millions and millions of saints. I heard one statistic was over 50 million martyred saints down through the centuries. I don't know. But the point is, it has been tens of millions of Christians were killed by the Catholic Church. Even up into the 1940s, over in Yugoslavia, they were killing people right and left now they were greek orthodox maybe they weren't all saved i don't know but the fact of the matter is the catholic church will kill you if they get the chance to do it okay so people say well well shouldn't we just as christians shouldn't we forgive them shouldn't we just forgive and forget god doesn't god's not going to just you know forgive and forget now he hasn't destroyed them yet because he's long suffering but the time will come when he'll say, when it comes into his mind, oh yeah, and then he gets them. And it'll be bad. It'll be very quick. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. 
basically describes the bride of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, verse 11 through 16, Jesus and his armies prepare for battle and then return to the earth. We'll be coming back. Uh, Revelation 19, verses 17 through 21, describes the battle of Armageddon. And there you have the Antichrist, of course, being taken out and the false prophet. They're not even given the... Uh, well, I'll just read here quickly. Verse 20, Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant sat down with Jesus and had a nice peace treaty. And no, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now keep in mind, like I said, these people are the ones that rejected Jesus Christ. And, you know, this could be seven years from now. There could be people alive on this earth right now that are going to be part of this army. So you have um, this thing of these people being in this army. They're rejecting Jesus Christ first of all but then you have them going through the tribulation and all these things are happening and yet they're still not repenting you read that time and time again so when Jesus Christ takes vengeance on these people it's not oh why would he do that that's so sad no they had chance after chance after chance to repent and there are many people that are like that today that they've had so many chances to repent and they don't do it Okay, um, now we're going to read Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 1, down through verse 4. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. If you are a Bible-believing Christian... If you have any sense at all, you have to be premillennial. Jesus Christ comes back before the thousand years. He sets up the thousand year millennial kingdom. They ruled or they, they lived and reigned with Christ with Christ a thousand years. Okay, now turn to Isaiah chapter eleven. Three more places here that we're going to look up and then we'll we'll be done. Isaiah chapter eleven, verse six. What will the millennial kingdom be like? And by the way, Romans chapter 16 verse 20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now the prophecy there back in the book of Genesis chapter 3 uh, verse 15 says about that Jesus Christ will bruise the serpent's head. But we are members of his body. Okay. In the millennial kingdom... Satan is going to be under our feet in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. I'll give him some time to think. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Why will the earth be full of the knowledge of the Lord? Because Jesus Christ will be here. It isn't because we're going to bring in a, a wonderful kingdom Man will bring it in and, and will teach the right doctrines. That's nonsense. Man has proved over 6,000 years that he can't rule anything. 
you know, there's not a civilization on this planet that's ever lasted more than about 300 years. Okay, what makes you think that we could make it for a thousand years? Well, we're more intelligent now. No, we're not. You know, no way. Verse 10, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day said, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. There aren't going to be many of them, but uh, from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Okay, now that's kind of happening right now, but Jesus Christ is not on the throne in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Okay, now turn over to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Not his preachers, not his official holy church. He will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Is it happening today? No. Is it going to happen because man brings it in? No. It's ridiculous. How could you be anything but a premillennial believer? Uh, verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. God's going to restore the nation of Israel. Okay, and then he himself will be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, we don't have time for it this morning, but you can read a lot, a, a great deal about this kingdom in Zechariah chapter 14. Now, finally, we'll turn back to First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 16. Now, if you have a Jewish Bible, uh, of course, they don't have the New Testament. They don't believe in the New Testament yet. They will be believing in it in the tribulation they're going to that'll be their play by play but first corinthians or yeah first chronicles chapter 16 verse 28 through 36 and as i was saying this is actually the last book in a jewish bible verse 28 give unto the lord ye kindreds of the people give unto the lord glory and strength give unto the lord the glory due unto his name bring an offering and come before him worship the lord in the beauty of holiness Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. Let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice, and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. That's your picture of the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ here Physically, the mystery of God is finished. People can see God manifest in the flesh over in Jerusalem. And we, his people, if you're saved today, you're going to be ruling and reigning with him. Now, your amount of service that you do right now in this life will guarantee you a position in that millennial kingdom. And if you don't suffer, if you don't do anything for the Lord, you're not going to have a, a you know, real high position in the millennial kingdom. Um, 
But if you do a good job for the Lord, you're going to be here. I, you know, I think that we're all going to be here for that millennial kingdom. And it's not going to be us that brings it in. And it, it didn't already happen. Okay, you cannot be amillennial. You cannot be postmillennial. You must be premillennial if you're a Bible believer. And you must be pre-tribulation rapture as well. Anything else is heretical. And it will me it'll mess you up. You'll get, you'll get messed up in false doctrine. And the Roman Catholic Church, Mystery Babylon, the one that God pours his wrath out and destroys them in one hour, they are the ones that have taught these heresies. Post-millennial, post-tribulation, they're the ones that have taught it down through the centuries, not Bible-believing Christians. So that's it for this morning. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.